Hey guys, uh, in this video I'm doing a leak finder for Brahmin C. Uh, he was a student at me and Primo's camp in Austin, Texas uh, back in May 2011. So I'm pretty familiar with this game. Um, I guess all of these games in this video are taking place at the $30 level on Stars. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to play on Stars, uh, so this is the only way that I'm able to do some videos with uh, stars stack sizes. Um, I may be making some trips up to Canada though, uh, about starting in about a month or so, uh, and maybe playing some myself on stars. Um, mainly because I just want to play some hypers and see how I do on there. I'm just jealous of all you guys that are able to grind on there. So, um, so yeah, um, we can go and get started. Yeah, I think readless, really standard, three bet shove. Uh, a lot of the hands that he's gonna, most villains are gonna min raise call and not all in three bet, um, are gonna realize equity pretty well versus sorry, ace king, ace queen hands. Um, and I think actually um, most villains are going to min raise call a three bet shove uh, with a wider range than they will 4-bet shove over a non-all-in 3-bet, that we should maximize expectation that way usually. Um, I talked about this in my last Hyper video. When, when I would switch to a non-all-in 3-bet is when I'm playing someone who I think um, will be induced more by the non-all-in size. You know, a lot of regs will, will possibly jam their ace 3 suited over a non-all-in 3-bet 25 deep, but because they think you 3-bet bluff wide, uh, or three bet wide, um, but they would not min raise call a hand like that. Um, that that should make your expectation better in that way. It's not so much about the flatting ranges, in my opinion. So our first min raise gets three bet shot. I'm not really going to make too many adjustments based on that. Um, I definitely think just check folding here is best, <clears throat> and even. I think people have a tendency to try to stab this turn card, and maybe it's something that I actually used to do myself, uh, thinking that ranges would be weak here, but really, like, if you think about it, um, I mean, unless he's just the most fitter fold player ever, like, if he has air on that flop, we look really weak, we, did, we check back pre and check the flop, that he's got a lot of incentive to stab his air there. Um, that I actually expect the check back range to have a lot of, at least marginal, showdown value that won't fold to a turn lead, that... Um, I think it's not such a good idea to try to stab the pot on the turn there, st stab on the turn. Um, so our first two min raises get three bet shoved. Um, I think that you could take some hands and limp here. This isn't one of them. And no, we, now we've been three bet shoved, uh, three out of three. Um, so I definitely uh, have more of a limping range here on the next button and probably uh, min raise call definitely wider at this point. Um, just to finish that thought, um, like the kind of hands that I would be limping would be stuff like King Five suited through like middle connected stuff like Ten Nine off, um, min raising a more polarized range between hands that min raise call easily um, and hands that min raise fold easily, or and also don't realize equity well in limp pots like uh, King Two off. Um, Jack four suited stuff like that. So good flat out of position. I actually really like leading this turn card, um, mainly because it really, uh, if you think about a typical check back range on this board, it shouldn't include a whole lot of ten x. I mean, maybe like stuff like uh, queen ten. I mean, it depends how wide a c betting range is. But even assuming if he checks back all of his over cards or all his ace highs or anything like that. Um, we can have a lot more, we can wrap a lot more uh, like strong equity and value combos on this board than he can. I mean, we can make the assumption he's c-betting all his flush draws, he's c-betting all his top pairs, all his good combo draws, over pairs. Um, that, I mean, you know, if we run into like ace-10 or king-10 or queen-10 or something like that, like, so be it. I think that he's going to have a lot more ace and king highs and um, maybe like a marginal pair, like a four or something like that. Um, that I don't typically love 
just like leading any two cards, and we're not really leading a whole lot of equity here, that um, this, in my opinion, is kind of like leading any two cards, basically. Um, it is. Uh, so, but I think we can be exploitive here, given how weak the average range is, and I think most villains are going to fold too much in this spot. Um, but some turn cards that I would not lead on, I probably would not lead on especially an ace turn, just because I think an ace is going to be a big part of a check back range. Um, and uh, that's, that's actually probably it. Uh, maybe, uh, actually no, like a turn that pairs the board probably, uh, six, five, or four. Um, you're probably going to get called down by ace and king high too much with uh, so many draws on the board and everything. Um, and I think most villains would have a lot of reason to believe that they're uh, Ace or King High is still good enough at that point. Um, but I think people make enough folds here. So I like the half pot lead as long as we're going to be following it up with a river bet on basically on rivers that uh, don't pair the board. Um, again, like I think that, um, you know, if, if the, a non diamond river that pairs the board. So, like, you know, if the river is a four of clubs or it's the six of clubs or ten of spades, something like that. Um, Again, I think it's just a river card where it's too easy for ace and king high to find reasons to call with uh, so many missed draws. I think 5x and stuff like that is still going to find enough reason to call at that point. So we want to have a plan for a lot of different turn cards. Like I said, leading wide, leading any two cards on this turn I think is fine, uh, but we need to be realistic about uh, what river cards we can continue on and have a plan. I think it's pretty weird uh, to get raised here. I don't expect it a whole lot. I mean, he's three bet shoved, three out of three. Now he's raised in the spot where we don't expect to get raised much. That he seems definitely like um, a uh, a little bit different than you know a lot of our population tendencies. But again, it's a pretty small sample, so it's hard to say. Um, and it, you know, it's very likely he just had a hand like king ten there. So and it would make total sense that um, I don't think we can make too many crazy adjustments at this point. Um, so, uh, but I, th I think you've played, played fine so far here. Um, I, I think, I think um, trying to deviate from Nash is a good thing, especially, you know, 9, 10, 11 big blinds deep. I think too many people default to it. It is, you know, it's unexploitable, it's not optimal, and we're trying to maximize our EV. Um, the problem, only problem I have with limping at this stack depth with a hand that jams so well uh, I mean, we're never going to be doing too bad, uh, is, um, is the fact that he's three best shoved three out of three, and then played another hand post-flop kind of weird, that his aggression seems very high so far, that I'm a little bit afraid to get limped, uh, for us to limp and get jammed off our hand really, uh, a really high percentage of the time, that I, I think it's probably better to just go ahead and jam at this point. But at the same time, like, I don't want to discourage um, you from limping because it's something I'm going to talk about more in this video is how I don't think you limp enough. But I think this is a hand in a stack depth where we probably want to be, uh, to be jamming a lot more given what we know about our villains so far. Um, you know, we don't want to risk uh, getting jammed off our hand. And uh, I think we have some reason to uh, believe that at this point. 